Michael Goldberg out in person. He's participated in a few virtual events with us, um, but we're glad we're able to take advantage of his trip to Asia to bring him to Jakarta. Um, the program he's on is basically we look to bring U.S. experts here to share um, their knowledge and expertise um, both in Jakarta and around the rest of Indonesia. So um, after a couple of days in Jakarta, he's actually headed out to Medan and then Surabaya. Um, but without further ado, I just want to say thank you all so much for your time and um, welcome uh, here on behalf of the U.S. Embassy. And let's get started and learn a lot tonight. Good evening. Uh, sorry, 100 minutes late. The traffic in Jakarta, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, it's no problem, right? Wow. Um, yeah, I learned about what do you guys call it? Rubber time? Rubber time. Sorry. I was taking advantage of rubber time. Um, Alright, so first let me learn a little bit about you. So how many here are entrepreneurs in the room? Okay. How many investors? <laughs> Others? <laughs> Others would be interested in entrepreneurship. Couldn't get tickets to the uh, Rolling Stones concert. <laughs> uh, okay. So, and I know Wemby's Wem not here yet. Robert time. Okay. All right. So here's uh, my background um, from Cleveland. Anybody been to Cleveland here? Anybody heard of Cleveland? Or a couple. So Cleveland. Uh, I went to Princeton. Um, the thing I'm most famous about at Princeton is that I, I beat Ted Cruz in an election my freshman year. I was the president of my class. <laughs> That'd be a true story. This is my son Matthew. Would that be Ted Cruz? Yeah. I didn't beat Trump. That's a whole, that's a whole other story. Uh, I did go to work for Trump, but unfortunately. Uh, and uh, I worked at Microsoft and America Online. Have you ever remember AOL? Many of my, how many in this room have never used a phone dial up phone line to get your internet? Yeah. Yeah, people, right? Never. You have, right? These are like mortgage. My students in the US have never used a phone line to get their internet. Whoopi, no? Whoopi, right? yeah. All right. Yeah. Now we know how old we, we know how old we are. Yeah. So that was the first internet wave. I was there before we merged with Time Warner. Um, I run a venture capital fund. Um, which I'll talk a little bit about um, with a partner in Israel. Uh, and I teach at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. Um, I also did a Fulbright, which I'll tell you about in a minute. How many of you are familiar with the Fulbright program? This is my advertisement. Um, I mean, not just Fulbright, the US government has a number of programs. If you want to go to the United States for free, courtesy of tax US taxpayers, I highly recommend it. The other Indian, okay. Not Indonesian partners. Okay. No, no, there's an Indonesian program called the Indian. Their okay. government will Oh, there? Okay. If you want to go to the United States on your tax dollars or my tax dollars, you should do that. These programs are great. I did a Fulbright in Vietnam, which I'll tell you about in a second. So that's us in 2012. There's Matt. Funny, there's you. The, young, uh, uh, the younger version of him. Um, so in 2012, I was a Fulbrighter in Vietnam, in Hanoi. Um, I taught at the National Economics University, and I was asked by the um, Vietnamese government to do a seminar on how Vietnam could become more like Silicon Valley. Um, and I thought it was not very realistic. Um, I mean, how many of you have been to San Francisco here, or Silicon Valley? Quite a few. Okay. The Bay Area. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that Silicon Valley is what it is today, but it's such a unique ecosystem um, in terms of private capital supporting entrepreneurship that in many ways it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to replicate, but everybody wants it. Um, and I suggested instead that I should teach a course about 
a different community that I thought was more relevant. By the way, do, do, can you hear me without the microphone? Wow. Or do you prefer yeah. the microphone? More clear. Uh, more clear without the microphone. Okay, yeah. Let me turn this Actually, the other thing, when I was at Princeton, I was the uh, first at beat tech first, but I was also the uh, radio announcer for my for my basketball team. So I had some experience yelling. Uh, so anyway, I decided to not do the program on Silicon Valley, and instead I decided to do a program on another city. Does anyone know that city? Matthew? Cleveland. Cleveland. All right, so that's, anybody a fat fan of basketball here? LeBron, baby. That's where LeBron James plays. Go Cavs. They won today. Any Warriors fans in here? Uh, so this is Cleveland. So 100 years ago, Cleveland was at the sort of center of the economic universe. So we're about, we're very close to Detroit and Pittsburgh. So. Steel is made in Pittsburgh. Things came, came to Cleveland. Lots of manufacturing, moving to Detroit. So um, this is actually our most famous entrepreneur who came from Cleveland. Anybody know who this is? Matthew? John D. Rockefeller. He's heard this presentation. <laughs> All right, so then globalization hits. Our factory jobs went away. Many of them came to Asia. Cleveland's economy was awful, right? Um, our population was the fifth largest in the U.S. falling um, in 1920 and fell to 47th in 2012. And then on entrepreneurship, and this is what I want to kind of discuss with you guys. So 10 years ago, actually in 2001, so about 15 years ago, Entrepreneur Magazine did a study of how well our community was supporting entrepreneurs. And they ranked 61 cities in the U.S. and how well they supported entrepreneurship. Does anyone want to guess where Cleveland ranked? <laughs> number 61. We had like a chant. We're number 61. Um, you know, and I was like a young person. I mean, I graduated from university or from high school in like 1988. I went off to Prince and I was like, I'm never coming back to Cleveland. It's not a place, we didn't have venture capital funds, we didn't have angel investors, we didn't have accelerators, we didn't have FBs, we had nothing, right? Um, and our young people were moving out and going to other places. So, um, actually at that point, McKinsey, anybody know McKinsey Consulting Firm? So they did a pro bono project for free, free is good, um, to basically look at what we should do in our community to support entrepreneurship. So, you know, as I mentioned, in Silicon Valley, at this point, it's a very um, well-developed, privately funded startup. Like, who's my, who's an entrepreneur in here? Okay, what, do you, what does your company do? Um, just Woo, sweet. What's the name of your company? Home. 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 Sounds good. All right, so if you're going out to Silicon Valley, you would pitch a bunch of private investors, angels, and they would be investing in you because they, what are the, why would they invest in you? What do they want? Do they, what, is, what is an invest, what would an investor in Silicon Valley want in you? When they, if they heard your pitch, why would they invest? Because I just want to interesting. That's interesting. They want to make money, right? So these are like private return on investment oriented. And so the state of California does not have a program to support, you know, entrepreneurs, right? There's, there's the state of California doesn't have any, they don't, there's no Gepi in <laughs> California and San Francisco. They don't need it. Right? I mean, they don't need a government and donor funded organization like Gepi to support, you're gonna go out there and pitch your business and, you know, it's private people looking to make money. So why, when you live in Cleveland or you live in Jakarta, why doesn't it work like it works there? Well, in Northeast Ohio, basically, and I think it's very similar here, we had to look to other sources of support. So one is government. Um, we've actually, and I'll get into kind of how government is supporting 
the growth of entrepreneurship in Cleveland because it's, it's interesting. And I know government, at least on the Indonesian government side, seems to not be doing a lot. I've been in Indonesia for 18 hours. <laughs> so I'm an expert, right? <laughs> Uh, I've had some conversations today, and so I know a little bit about the ecosystem here. The second piece is, um, I don't know, like I said, people shaking hands. That's more of like donors, right? So the fact that Gepi is supported by originally U.S. government, also large, um, well-known folks in the Indonesian business community. You know, and they're doing this not necessarily only for return on investment. And then the third piece is to make money, right? So we have all, all of those things in Cleveland we tried to set up for our ecosystem. I want to talk to you briefly about that. Um, anyway, I just did, when I was in Vietnam, I did a, a bunch of Skype sessions. So that's like the woman who ran our program called The Third Frontier. It's a $2.3 billion program. And anyway, I did this session in, in, in Hanoi, and then I was like, okay, I've never like, taught that before, and I came back to the US. Um, that was our graduation. So basically what ended up happening was, how many of you are familiar with, the, have you heard of MOOCs? Matthew, anybody else? Or Coursera, it's called Massive Open Online Courses. Anybody been on a course on Coursera? Um, so, MOOCs were started a few years ago by a Stanford professor named Sebastian Thrun. He, put up, he thought he'd have a couple hundred people take an artificial intelligence course. He put it up online and they had over 160,000 students. So, most of them are free. Um, and I basically decided to turn my um, seminar I did in Vietnam into a MOOC. Um, we've had about 100,000 students from 190 countries take the class. Um, this is sort of like, it's basically documentary style. Anybody seen the American television program 60 Minutes before? So a friend of mine used to work for 60 Minutes and she helped me. So that's me interviewing all these people and doing this course about basically like what Cleveland did to support entrepreneurship. Um, I just want to briefly get into the specifics because what I was asked to talk about tonight is really sort of the, fun, the funding environment um, of kind of how, it, how we've done it in Cleveland. Um, this is that state to the regional government. It's a $2.3 billion program to focus on commercialization. And I'll, I'll tell you about the different ways the program works in a second. Um, interestingly, this Fund for our economic future, and again, I don't exactly understand how GEPI works. I met today with the um, managing director of Endeavor Indonesia. Do you guys know Endeavor? How many are familiar with Endeavor? So the idea that lots of wealthy individuals or foundations would come together to support entrepreneurship. I mean, in Cleveland, that was very new. Um, what are thing? What are what do foundations typically support? Social causes, they might support homelessness, they might support all sorts of different issues. Um, they support the arts. So in Cleveland, we have a wonderful art museum, we have a great orchestra. Um, but one of the heads of the largest foundations in Cleveland made a comment to me, he said, if we don't support, start, start build, supporting entrepreneurs and startups and creating jobs, there's not gonna be anybody left in Cleveland to go to the orchestra. So it's this interesting concept of um, philanthropy supporting startups. You know, and it's, it's somewhat controversial. I mean, you know, if we support, if you have donors, there's only so much money to go around. It's like, you know, many people in our community are like, why are philanthropists supporting startup guys? Why are they not doing education or social programs? Well, it's not, the answer isn't necessarily we're doing it instead. They're trying to do it together, but it's somewhat controversial. I mean, they had never really, the foundations in our community had never really supported entrepreneurship. I'm sorry? Well, that's what we should talk about, man. It's supposed to be sustainable. So theoretically, again, and you guys are doing it here, new job, net new job creation comes from startups and new companies. I mean, larger companies are not creating jobs for more people. But it's an interesting topic, and I think we should hopefully cover it tonight. It's like, 
what should be the role of donors. Also in the United States, we have tax incentives. So when people donate money to a not-for-profit or non-governmental organization, you can write that off on your taxes. As I understand it, that doesn't exist in, in Indonesia. Um, so I just mentioned um, Endeavor. Jumpstart is our local NGO or not-for-profit. Um, it actually has a fund. So um, actually Jumpstart's invested about $30 million um, from a dedicated fund. And the way that the fund works is, if they're successful in my traffic solving guy here, if he's successful, and, and success for startups, really they're sort of, when, when, when early stage investors are investing in startups, how do we get our money back? There's really two ways, typically. What are the two ways? <laughs> Selling it, so an acquisition, and the second way, IPO, right? Both are hard. IPO, very hard. But the idea is when we'd sell or an IPO, the money that Jumpstart would make would go back into the fund. So it's this evergreen model of a fund, which is very interesting. Actually, Endeavor has a fund, not in Indonesia, but their Endeavor Catalyst Fund, which is investing companies around the world, has a similar model. So the money's going back into the fund. Um, you know, the role of universities is very big. Just as an example, like we, this is a fund that our university set up. Half the money comes from the university and half the money comes from government. So that state of Ohio fund. And it's funding primarily what we call technology transfer. So ideas that are being transferred out of the laboratories at our university. We have about $400 million in government research that goes into um, you know, into lab work. And you know, one of the hard, do any of you work at universities? No one? One of the hardest things is taking great technology out of university into companies and commercializing it. Um, and I know actually I was hearing today about what is happening between um, Gepi and Sibutra and the incubator. I mean, I think some of these partnerships between universities, and I know other folks I even met today, I mean, this idea of co-location and incubation and you know, is there, are there dollars that go along? This is just an example of where a, um, a university and government partner together to deploy capital on companies. Um, you know, this term seed acceleration is, is growing, and as I understand it, um, Techstars is going to be setting up an operation here in, in Jakarta. Is that true? Techstars coming? Techstars, yes. That's what I hear. Um, but does 500 startups have an accelerator? I know they're doing investment. They don't have an actual physical accelerator. Uh, I mean, this model, which um, I don't know how, and is this, is this an active, is this accelerator active? Yeah. GNB? Yeah. Just starting. So the typical model in the US, I mean, it mimics Y Combinator and Techstars. There's an investment um, for a percentage of equity, usually. Depends on how big the accelerator is, but in, in, in Ohio, it's about twenty-five thousand dollars for about six or seven six or seven percent equity in a company. Um, this program in Ohio, interestingly, the twenty-five thousand dollar investment into startups is actually a grant from government to the accelerator, and then the accelerator takes the equity in the startup. So again, one of the things that I just wanted to share today are kind of creative ideas. Like, is that the best use of government money? Should government be investing $25,000, granting, sorry, granting $25,000 to an accelerator to invest in startups? Well, we didn't have any accelerators in Ohio, so this was our way to kind of kickstart the acceleration product process. Is it working? Well, we'll see. Um, in Cleveland, we had zero accelerators, then we had three, now we have one. I mean, it takes a long time for any of you in the early stage business. True success of these, whether it's an accelerator or even the whole ecosystem, we're measuring this in, in decades, okay? This doesn't happen fast. Um, let's talk about angel investors, and I met with um, David today and another one of your colleagues. Um, I thought this was really interesting, you know, 
And how do you, is it Ungen? How do you pronounce it? Ungen. How many of you, has any, are any of you gotten money yet from Ungen? Not yet? So, I mean, when I asked David from Ungen today, I was like, why, why are the angels in Indonesia investing? So let me ask you, what are they, why are, because, and this is a pledge fund model. So the idea of this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's not a dedicated amount of money. So you're basically saying, okay, we're going to get, how many angels are in Angen now? Like 30? 30? One, three. Okay, not that big. 30 soon. 13. So they go and hear pitches, and then they say, hey, we're pledging to invest, but it's not a dedicated fund. Okay? What, what are some of the motivations? Why are angels interested in doing this? What are the motivations? ROI. Okay, ROI should be, I mean, this is not a donation, right? So they want to make money, right? I mean, if you were pitching a, you know, the example we gave of my friend here, if he's pitching in Silicon Valley, that's really the only thing they care about. But, like, what are the other factors? Like, what else matters besides ROI? Like, why are these 13 angels signed up? Portfolio. Portfolio, let's talk about that. What do you mean? Investing in growing companies. Okay. So, they, but, so, but that's, you said ROI before. What are the other reasons besides having a portfolio, besides just making money? What else do they care about? Creating jobs. Okay, creating jobs. Okay. So they, and why? Why do they care about creating jobs? Compassion, okay. Creating a goodwill for Okay, goodwill, right. I think that's a piece of it. I mean, you know, and again, you, my friend from Gepi, you can let me know why why the lar the people on your board, why are they doing this? Why, you know, Endeavor's model is that Endeavor is funded by like eight or nine wealthy Indonesians. They're doing it for goodwill, creating jobs. CSR project. Right. I mean, so there's a corporate social responsibility piece here, right? Um, I mean, even in Ohio, we've done a couple of interesting things. So this is a dedicated fund, okay? So in Ohio, that model is that you actually write a check for $25,000 each. They have 99 active angels. Now, our state government, again, playing a role. And again, I'm not saying that this is the right or the wrong thing. There's a couple things that they do. One is... The state is paying the fees of the of the people managing that fund. Because to run a good fund, it takes people to do the due diligence, do all the work beforehand. Um, and the other thing that we did in Ohio was that we give a tax credit. So 25% of every, if I would invest, you know, a do, every dollar I invest in your company, I can write 25% off of it off on my taxes right away. Okay. Even if I make a lot of money, you can still write that off. Um, in, um, in Turkey, I spent some time in Turkey, there is a tax credit. They're really trying to encourage the formation of angel funds. Okay? Um, and again, these are just sort of, as, you, as you're part of the ecosystem here, I mean, as entrepreneurs, on one level, you're like, okay, how do I get money to run my business, to develop my technology, to hire people? But, I guess part of my goal tonight is to help you think, all right, let's take a step back because you're all, you all want the ecosystem to be strong to provide these things for you in terms of investment and support. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is venture capital. Um, so I run a venture capital fund. Uh, I have a partner based in Israel. We invest in early stage medical device companies. Our largest investor is the Ohio Capital Fund. Does anyone want to guess where did the Ohio Capital Fund get their money? <laughs> government. So it's a government, it's a $150 million, what's called a fund of funds. So it's actually managed by this group that are a private wealth you know, manager. And they're investing in venture capital funds. And there's some, you know, we call strings <laughs> attached to the money. So they're investing in um, venture capital funds that have an operation in Ohio and that half of the money that we invest needs to go in Ohio. Well, what it's done is actually a number of venture capital funds from outside of Ohio have opened up offices in Ohio to try to get some of their money. Um, 
how is it working? Well, it takes time, right, to know if these things are working. Politically, and I think this is, you know, in a, and this is happening in the U.S. and it probably happens here as well, you know, as our political leaders change. So kind of interestingly, in Ohio, that third frontier program I mentioned, it was started by a Republican governor. Then he lost the election and a, and, a, and a governor from the Democratic Party came in. Now what do you think typically happens to programs that were started by someone in, the, in a different party? <laughs> Throw them out, right? Like, political leaders never get credit for keeping the programs of the last person, right? Even if they're actually good ideas. But actually in Ohio, he had a lot of pressure from the business community to keep those programs in place, so they kept it. So we had started by a Republican governor, continued by a Democrat, and now, actually the only Republican candidate who's still in the race who I didn't mention is the governor of Ohio, John Kasich. He's now our governor, and he's actually kept in place mostly these programs, but like, he doesn't like this program. And he's probably getting rid of that program. It's not being renewed. The tax credit that I mentioned, the 25% tax credit for angel deals has not been renewed. All of these things have costs. Um, you know, we talked about donors and philanthropy. Um, one of the things I talk about in my MOOC is what we call like donor fatigue. Do you know the word fatigue? It means fatigue is how you feel when you're sitting in Jakarta traffic. <laughs> like you're so tired. Right. So, you know, we talk about all this stuff. We're going to like support entrepreneurs, and we've got all these people, you know, working here in this co-working space, and this is great. And then 10 years from now, like, if your company wasn't successful, or yours wasn't successful, or these guys weren't, it's like, oh, that didn't work. What's the next thing? Well, the problem is, is like, you've got this Silicon Valley wasn't created in one decade. It takes decades. What we're doing in Cleveland, we're in a year like 12 or 13, it's like an experiment. So one of the things that we're preaching is you've just got to be patient. Um, I mean, the average from first money into a company until exit, you know how long it typically takes, if you're successful, how long is it taking from, for, in the US, how long is it taking from first money into an exit? Five years, seven, up. 20, then lower. It's about 10, 12 years, right? So it's, and this is for the ones that are successful, right? So investors are impatient. They want their money in two, five years. Government's impatient. I mean, we have what we call term limits. I mean, you can only be in office for four years or eight years, right? So I think one of the biggest challenges that I would put out there, because um, I think where Indonesia is, just for my brief discussion. And I think one thing that's interesting is that there are venture capital funds, like, and I met somebody from East today, I met somebody from Fenox, I met somebody from a couple other funds. Like, I was surprised how many funds are here. These funds don't have money from government. There's some money from overseas, from Singapore, from the U.S. and other places. There seems to be enthusiasm about the Indonesian market. I mean, we may hear other things from entrepreneurs who are saying, okay, it's, it's always hard, right? So I'm not saying it's easy to access this money, but my, my initial read after being here for a short amount of time is that there's enthusiasm from investors in this market. It doesn't mean that it's easy to get money. Um, but again, I think the question is, like, how patient are, how patient are people going to be to make this work? Let me pause, is Wimpy here? No. Hey, okay. You're up, man. Would you want to have a question and answer with me and then we'll turn it over to okay. okay. Alright. Okay. Yeah. I was telling Karen before, one of the, like the things that I've tried to learn in teaching is like to stop talking. I'm stopping. Let's hear from you. What questions do you have? Silence. <laughs> All right, great. So uh, one of the challenges in Indonesia right now that we're facing. Here, you want to do? I'll, I'll scream. You can use the microphone. Yeah, right. So 
one of the one of the challenges that we have right now in Indonesia is that uh, startup is something new, right? So uh, our level of uh, readiness is very, very, at a very, very. Your level base. of what? Readiness. Readiness. Okay. Yeah, readiness. To okay. That. We're not professional ready for most of the cases. Right. And although you're right that we have many funds that would like to come to Indonesia, but they cannot find like the right one. The right deal. The right. Okay. Uh, the right companies to invest in. Okay. Because we just they said that we're not ready. Okay. So the question is, I think it's very interesting if you can share a little bit about what you did in Ohio, yeah. what happened in Ohio, and, and the role of government or maybe private sectors to support all these uh, startups at the very, very basic level. Yeah. Let's just get. I mean, I asked the same question to some of the event, some of the investors today about we as we call it pipeline. Like, what does the pipeline look like in Indonesia? And I got people said it was sort of mixed, right? So. And again, I think from an entrepreneur's point of view, you're like, what do you mean it's been, you guys, we're great. Like, we're ready. Um, I think some of it is, I mean, it was interesting how you pointed out on your slide how many, I mean, just because you went to Harvard Business School or Wharton or somewhere, that doesn't mean that you know anything necessarily about this market. So I think it's great what you're doing to build domestic <laughs> talent here, right? Um, this whole question, I think, of failure is a really interesting one. You know, oftentimes in Silicon Valley, many investors will like to say they want to see, you know, what you've done before. Um, I assume, and I heard this a little bit, many of the entrepreneurs are first time entrepreneurs. And that's okay. Um, and most of you will fail. And that's okay. Uh, and sort of what do you do with that failure to prepare yourself for the next time around? Um, Again, that takes time. That doesn't answer the question of like, how do you build this today? Uh, I mean, I was with an entrepreneur, a friend of mine, about a week ago, we did a session in Cleveland. She was a biomedical engineer from India. Her partner was a biomedical engineer from China. No business experience, zero. They started a medical device company. No one wanted to invest in them. They ended up attracting some to the team of somebody with business experience. I ended up like that person didn't even work out. Anyway, after 12 years, they sold the company to Medtronic. It was a really nice story. Actually, she's in my movie. But, you know, it's funny, like what makes a great team? Like what did you do? What did you do before? So you can't, you're still working. What, what do you, are you, you have a job? You have a day job? What's your day job? Um, working the whole company. Okay. But you don't, you're not doing, you're not making the leap to your startup full time yet. Until okay, so you're waiting. Who else? What else? Who are my other entrepreneurs here? Yeah. What do you? What do you? What did you? Are you doing this full time? Your startup. Okay. What do you do? What's your? What's? What do you do? What's your full time job? I'm consulting. Consulting. Okay. 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 Okay, interesting. Who's doing it full time? These guys are all. What's your what's what's your startup? Okay. And why did, did you what, what did you do before? Insurance industry. Okay. And you have fun. Have you raised money? What caused? But you quit your job. Wow. Okay. You're making the leap. Okay, I like it. I mean, it's interesting. This question. I mean, just at random, you know, and that's normal. Like. It's hard to quit your day job until you're kind of ready. You know, it's a big risk to do this. You know, I mean, how much run? How much money do you have in the bank until you raise money? How long can you support yourself until you raise money? Uh, okay. Okay. So do you can, do you have revenue already? And that's the other question, right? Do you? Grow. I mean, you know. And do we have any? Who else? Who are the other? Are there other investors in the room? I mean, maybe the worst idea sometimes is to take money from a venture capitalist. I mean, it's very expensive money. Like it can give you help you grow, but maybe if you can get sales and grow more slowly, you don't have to give up part of your company, right? Um, 
But the question is, if you've got such a great idea that needs to get to market, you know, like our traffic, you know, this guy needs to solve the traffic problem now before somebody else does, right? I mean, how many ideas people are going to kind of be sitting on? So, I, I, mean, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I mean, we do a lot of the same things in terms of acceleration and, you know, mentoring and all these different things to try to, like, support folks, but it's hard. of the money for something, it's probably not going to work. Right. 
And then in markets, and again, I'm not making a comment on Indonesia, but like when I lived in Vietnam, there was so much corruption that like a government program funding 100% of something was usually going to someone brother, yes. not the best entrepreneur. Correct. So what we did in Ohio, which I think, there's two things that we did in Ohio that I think worked pretty well. One is we said, okay, like the example I gave um, <laughs> this program at, at, at the university. <coughs> so they said, all right, government says, we'll give you half the money. You guys come up with the other half. That really helped, right? Um, and that, and the matching money could come from a university, it could come from the private sector. The other thing is, in the evaluation of projects, they hired outside consultants. So government people themselves were not making decisions about which startups to back. The other thing that they've done, I mean, this, this is uh, an NGO. So governments, a lot of the funding for Jumpstart is from government. Now, it's interesting, I mean, there's a lot of NGOs in, in Indonesia. Yes? No, not much. But one of the things like in Cleveland is like we have all these NGOs now that take a lot of money. And actually, the, I mean, just interestingly, I'm just as an example, and this guy's a friend of mine, the person who runs Jumpstart, how much money do you think he makes a year? This is an NGO. How much do you think the guy who runs Jumpstart makes a year? It's public information. In the US, if you run an NGO, you have to do your tax back. So the taxes are online. So everybody knows how much you make. So you can go look it up. How much do you think the guy who runs this organization makes? Huh? 60,000 a year, okay. Six figures, but what do you think? 200. 200. Uh, less than a million, it like almost $500,000. So the head of the NGO that supports entrepreneurship, okay? So every year in the newspaper, who are my journalist friends here? Right. So you'd be like, report, you know, Jumpstart releases their salaries and the head of it makes $500,000 a year, $450,000. So what is the argument that the NGO makes about why they should pay somebody that much money? Right. So normally you'd be like, all right, we're going to pay $60,000 a year. But what are they saying? Why do they justify it? What's the justification? If you had to think of a justification. What do you think that the guy who runs that organization did before? Do you think he worked in government? He's a business person, right? So if you're going to attract business people to work for these organizations to deploy government money, don't you want people who have some experience? So they did. So a lot of the NGOs in Cleveland actually are, have people <coughs> at big salaries that have experience doing investment. So I think that really helps. So instead of like a $60,000 a year government employee trying to decide to invest in this guy's like, you know, traffic <coughs> app, they don't know anything about it, right? This organization has a bunch of people that actually came out of venture capital and private equity that have experience, right? Is that the right way to do it? I don't know. You know, I mean, Every year, and it's funny, like right now in the newspapers, you know, in the comments, so there'll be the article, people will write, you know, many people, I, can, I mean, many people are like very mad at this organization. Oh, they didn't fund, you know, like you would pitch Jumpstart, right? And they decide not to invest in you. What do you think you say? <coughs> oh, that guy, the guy who runs, they're bad. This guy makes a lot of money. You know, that's natural, right? Um, but I think, I mean, it's a very long way of answering your question, like, a, government having matching, you know, people from the outside matching it. B, having non-government people making decisions on sort of where the money goes. I think really helps. And I think C is paying good people. Yeah, huh? They come work there. All right. They're probably bringing that Right. I mean, he worked out in San Francisco. Um, I mean, another guy who worked there is a good friend of mine who worked at Apple and Netflix. I mean, I mean, if you want good people, you've got to pay them. So I think that's part of it. That's not, that's not easy for government. Right? Yeah. Yes? 
Okay. What do I look for in a startup founder? Um, you know, I think different investors have different points of view. I mean, I really think it's the team first. It's the team more than the idea. Um, and I think many investors also believe that. I mean, people will change their idea along the way. Um, and, you know, many people, I mean, I know like at Y Combinator, it's like, is there a, does the team have a technical person? And is there a business person? I mean, like that example I gave of those two biomedical engineering students with no business experience, you might look at them and be like, okay, who's going to run this business? I mean, can you bring in the team that you need? Um, and I think some of it is like, you know, back to like our friend's question about how do you sort of position your product and what's in the niche. I mean, showing that there's a problem that you're solving and that you have a solution that someone would pay for, that's helpful. Right, um, and I think, I and mean, it sounds like here in Indonesia, there are multiple ways that people are getting experience pitching. I mean, do you do, do you have practice doing pitches to others? My friend there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, at the, I mean, I don't know what you guys do for events here, but like, are people getting up? I mean, I would say entrepreneurs in general are getting much better and better at pitching. You know, because and you know. Getting that, what's your elevator speech? Like, how do you communicate it clearly? And there's, go on to the internet, I mean, watch, you know, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den or Demo Days at, at Y Combinator. There's lots of ways to sort of see how people communicate. I think that's a part of it. Yeah? How much will your venture capital invest in Indonesia this year? You know, it's funny. How much will my venture capital fund invest in Indonesia? So, David. Asking the same thing, he's like uh, the guy from Gepi Angel Network. So it's interesting. So part of this, is, here's my, I'm going to give you a lesson on venture capital, right? So my venture capital fund, I started in 2006, and I have not, none of my companies, I invested in five companies, none of the companies have exited or sold, you know, been acquired or had an IP. Do you think that I've been able to raise more money for my venture capital? <clears throat> How many think I could, re and I'll tell you one more story, we'll see if this changes I think. My best company, we invested in 2006, the valuation, it was a $5 million pre-money valuation. And last year, Samsung invested $20 million in the company and the post-money valuation was $120 million. <laughs> Who thinks that I've been able to raise more money for my venture capital? Who thinks I've not? Okay, there, are only two, there, are only, there are only two choices here. Right? How many think that I was able to raise more money so that I can invest in? Okay. How many think I was not able to raise more money? Okay, what, what are the rest of you people doing? How many are holding their hands right now? All right. Um, so I have not been able to raise any more money. Why not? Because I haven't had any exits. Venture capital, the people that gave me their money want their money back. They are return on investment investments, right? So I had my thesis was we're going to invest in these Israeli early stage companies. And I'm supposed to give them their money back by 10 years. Well, I'm on year 11, and I haven't given them their money back. How do you think they feel about their investment in my venture capital? happy, right? They would like their money back. They want profits, right? So I don't have any extra money to be investing in Indonesia right now, as excited I am about it. But the biggest challenge, I mean, that, that last story I told about the company that raised money from Samsung at $120 million valuation, that sounds like a really good investment, right? How many things that, that sounds like a good investment? If Samsung invested, and the company that I invested with, when I invested in it was $5 million, is now worth at a valuation of 120 million, how many think that that's good? Come on, hands. How many think that's bad? That's good, right? But what's the problem? Huh? Not a share. What's the big problem? What's my problem? Money companies didn't get their money back. So it's on paper. So on paper, it's worth more, but their companies haven't gotten their money back. So that's the challenge. I mean. 
all of you that are entrepreneurs, I think one thing you want to understand is how venture, how the structure of venture capital works, what the timing expectation is, because once you take money from someone like me, you're under pressure. You have to get their money back, right? Now, like that one company is a good company. I mean, I actually think they're doing everything that they can, but. So that's why I don't have any money to uh, invest in Indonesia. Yeah. So why didn't you sell your shares to something? To a third party? It's an interesting question. The question is, why didn't I sell my shares now or into the round? We talked about it. We couldn't. Now, what's, what happens often, this is the case for this deal, the new investor that comes in, they want their money to go into the company to help the company grow. They don't want to be buying out old shares. I could go sell my shares right now on the secondary market, but I wouldn't get the valuation of the last round. It would be some discount. And I'm like, I'd rather, I want to maximize my return. So I'm waiting. But waiting, I mean, for those that are finance, study finance, uh, internal rate of return, unfortunately, measures time too, right? So every year that goes by, my return is less because I've had those investors' money. But it's, I mean, it's a great question because at a certain point, maybe we should. We will. All right, so I turn it over to uh, my friend. Gil. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Can you please give me a good job?